So look who I found in Canada, everyone, Robbie Strike. So we're going to talk about antennas. Right on, yeah. Oh, wait, I want to talk about satellites. No, we should talk about antennas. Well, I'd like to talk about satellites. I want to talk about antennas. I want to talk about satellites. I want to talk about antennas. I want to talk about satellites. Ah! So in all seriousness, I have a few questions I'm going to ask Robbie, and he's going to ask me a few questions as well. And then after that, we're going to have a nice discussion about both free over-the-air TV and satellite TV. Yeah. So my question for you, Robbie, is how did you get into free over-the-air satellite TV? Satellite? Uh, well, I've always wanted a satellite. Like, um, at home, I always wanted, when I drew pictures in, in school, I drew houses with, like, satellite dishes on it, uh, solar panels. No way, I windmills. did that with yeah. antennas. Yeah, and, and antennas. antennas. Yeah, I had antennas and satellites, and I always wanted both. Like I have, well now now I have like I have multiple antennas on, on my tower. I have multiple satellite dishes. So kind of what I drew when I was a when I was a kid is coming to fruition, and uh, I actually have like all that stuff now. And I love both because with antennas and with satellite, you can kind of you can do a search and you can find stuff that no one else knows is out there. Not, not too many people know, uh, even in my area for over the air TV, people don't realize uh, that you can. Put an aerial up, which is pretty easy to do, and uh, get channels like um, south of the border here. And there's like, in my situation, I get 40 channels uh, over the air. And with my satellite, I get about a, maybe 100 channels. I mean, they're a lot harder to set up than an antenna, but uh, there's a whole lot of content out there. And then you kind of discover content that you might not discover. Um, I think that's another thing I like about it is the discovery of linear TV. You can put it on, there'll be a, a program on that you might not even know you're, you'd be interested in, but you kind of stop and you watch it. And that's kind of like with the internet now, it's like you have to search and find things. You don't necessarily discover things as well as with you if you were channel surfing. Yeah, that's what I like about linear TV. And I agree with you on the aspect of not only over the air, but free to satellite TV. The things that the, the, the TV stations and networks you're not familiar with, all this content, as you said, you tune in and there's something on and you discover things that way. You don't necessarily discover things on demand. I mean, sometimes you do, but I'm the kind of person, I think many of you out there are the same way, where it's just cool to select a channel and see what's on and discover some new things. And, and free to air satellite TV is probably really good for Canada, especially considering that over the air TV, there's not as many options yeah, as yeah. there are in the United States. If you like, if you're living in a town, like I live in Kingston, Ontario, and it, uh, we're, we're pretty close to the U.S. border. So we can pick up uh, Watertown and Syracuse and um, sometimes Ithaca. Uh, so we can pick up channels south of the border. Same thing with Toronto. A lot of the cities in Canada are pretty close to the U.S. border, so they can pick up a lot of the, uh, the U.S. channels. But here in Canada, uh, the broadcasters, for example, CTV, which is owned by Bell, um, typically are not... Uh, they, they've reduced their repeaters in rural areas mm -hmm. and so it's uh, unfortunately if you have a cottage you might have been always be able to watch TV with an antenna mm -hmm. and um, nowadays you can't really do just that. our luck isn't that yeah wonderful? Just our luck <laughs> well thankfully I have pretty good equipment so the microphone should cancel out some of the background noise I'm not gonna wait for this guy to stop he's got a, a, a lawn to mow and stuff like that but uh, <laughs> this is so funny. It's almost like he can surprise. cut that tree down. It's blocking one of my dishes. <laughs> Take his mower and drive over the tree. This is quite hilarious. But yeah, so one thing that most of you may not know about over-the-air TV in Canada is that they don't really have subchannels in the United States. So, for example, most of you know if you get like a local ABC, NBC, CBS station, there's like if it's channel seven, you get seven one, seven two, seven three, seven four with a variety of subchannels like me tv cozy tv um all that in canada that's not the there, case there, yeah we really don't have subchannels in the early days of digital we would have like they'd have like two subchannels which would be the, the the standard definition version of their channel and the high definition version of the channel and then they took that away so it'd be basically duplicates like yeah. you don't even get any new programming yeah i thought that was a joke because i read online that like some of them were multiplexing their signal and it's like it's the same thing why would you watch in standard definition if you had in high definition that was i don't know maybe they're testing the sub channel capability of their system but they just never really went forward i mean and there's so much they could do like in the early days of digital tv uh, even in the States, they would loop their weather or their newscast. They, but they don't seem to have that anymore, if you've noticed. You don't see that. But like 10 years ago, if you had a digital over-the-air TV, 
the your local channel would have like the news the newscast looped uh, on a on a sub channel. So that's crazy, Robbie. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were cord cutters back in the 2000s, but a lot of TV stations had that where they had like news and weather looped on the sub channel. And it sounds like they were on the right track, and then they went backwards by getting rid of you know those kind of sub channels and just yeah. showing the thing. But as you said, the main reason is that. So in the, in the United States, we have these big media companies that own local TV stations. And I thought that was bad, but then I realized they understand that over the air TV is a market in itself. And they're gonna at least try their best to embrace it and utilize it. While in Canada, the TV stations are owned by teleco, teleco companies, cable companies that literally do not want people to get their signal over the air. I don't know if they, that that's, that they may disagree with that, but they don't really seem to put an effort like how uh, in the US, uh, some of the channels have all the sub channels and all that. And obviously with Tyler and his channel, which had, it was just really blown up, there's a lot of interest for over the air t uh, TV. Just look at the Antenna Man's channel, he's got like, over 200,000 subscribers, millions you, of guys. views. And, uh, and yes, thanks for, for following Tyler. Because before Tyler, we had videos where people did top five antennas and they they uh, had like reviews of antennas. And then there was like some crappy antenna that was a flat indoor antenna was the number one antenna. And now we have Tyler, the antenna man, to give us uh, reviews and tell us what antennas are good and, and for your situation. And I think you've been really helpful to the over the air community uh, mm -hmm. for that because like, you're you're the guy you're the go-to guy for antennas well, thanks robbie that's one thing that always grinds my gears is when i see reviews of antennas both on youtube and, and amazon where someone basically says i got 40 channels it's a good antenna and there's no comparison as most of you probably saw i made a video of where you can get tv stations with a paper clip so just saying an antenna got you x amount of channels is not necessarily i mean it's better than nothing but um, what you want to do is you want to show your reception report. So if you get 40 channels in a weak signal area, that's pretty good. But getting just 40 channels alone doesn't necessarily mean anything. So I do appreciate yeah. the kind words about my channel. I always try to make it you know, more balanced. And, and there's, there's a data approach to reviewing antennas yeah. too um, that I try to do. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you may explore that route at some point, which yeah. would be really cool, and do it your own way. Um, but I just don't like when people review antennas and all they say is, I, I got this these channels. They need to compare it to another yeah. antenna, or at least show their reception report where, hey, I'm in a weak signal area. This is the report, shows the signals are weak. Because I have people that say, oh, I live in a valley and this got me 40 channels. Well, yeah, you live in a valley, but the broadcast towers is, is 2,000 feet tall above the valley, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, and another thing too is a lot of people uh, I was in a situation about 10 years ago where I lived in an apartment and I couldn't put up a tower or and I, I could barely put up a satellite dish. They really didn't want people putting satellite dishes on balconies. But I came up with all these clever solutions, even for indoor antennas. And I found buying an outdoor antenna and just putting it somewhere indoors because the outdoor antennas perform better even in indoors. Some of like, like those bigger antennas compared to rabbit ears because they're amplified and you'll get more signal. Uh, so luckily when I lived in an apartment, I was on the sixth floor. So I was able to get like, uh, I was able to get from Kingston. Some days I get Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. I actually did better in my apartment. I did better in that direction. The channels from that direction. That's like East. And uh, I was able to get channels a lot better with that. So, but I know a lot of people ha can't put up a 10 foot Yagi no. <laughs> in their house, but that's usually, that's going to be the antenna that's going to perform the be bigger is better with antennas. Same thing with satellite dishes. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you there. So when I was in college, I went to Penn State and I had the same situation where a small indoor antenna was not getting anything. So I had an outdoor antenna inside. Any of you could use this as well if you're in an apartment. The ones that work pretty well are the UHF bay style antennas, the ones that have like the figure eights. They're like the, the four bay and the two bay ones. Right. Those are pretty good because you have the ability to like, it has a gain of the outdoor and most most frequencies are on the UHF band, most TV stations. So um, it, it's going to work better than a small, like, clear stream antenna, for example, just because it has more gain. And it's a little more flat, so you can put it up against a wall or a window, and it's not too intrusive or yeah. anything like that. But I, I do know people who have, like, antennas, and they a little flat antenna, they put it on the wall, they get their local channel, and they're happy with that because they get their local news and that's all they care about. And that's great. I mean, I, I, I hope there's a lot of people that wake up to that, that even if they want to go, like, a very simple route, uh, and uh, that would, if that were to work for you, I mean, that'd be great just to get your local channels. Cause like sometimes a good percentage of the time when I actually watch TV, it's that local channel that I'm watching for the local news, uh, local content. Um, we, we had a channel here, CKWS, and a couple of years ago, it's kind of gone downhill a little bit, mm -hmm. but they used to have like a, t a couple hours a week of local content 
like uh, they kind of had like a sit down, you know, set up chair interview and they still have that. Um, but it's like you're not you're seeing less and less TV stations actually have that local content, I think, too. Yeah, that, that tends to happen as yeah. time goes on. We actually I stopped by his house yesterday and we talked about this, how the um, consolidation of media, basically these big media companies taking over these smaller stations is ending up with TV stations producing less local content and more state and national content because it's cheaper that way. But the end result is that communities lose certain things. I mean, if you guys ever had a media company take over a local TV station like Sinclair or Nexstar, the first thing they usually do is immediately just start laying off long-term talent and really what, what they refer, what I refer to as trimming the fat of a TV station. Right, but yeah. fat makes things good, you know, in terms of like fast food and, you know, delicious hamburgers. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes it, makes it good. If you trim all the fat, it's going to taste horrible. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way some TV stations are. They're bland and just soulless. Yeah. But um, yeah, so we talked a little about antennas. Um, tell me a little about free to air satellite TV, because I think that honestly, if you're in Canada or in a remote area where antennas don't work for local TV stations, free to air satellite TV could be a very good alternative. Yeah, yeah. If you're like in a more rural area, maybe not so much for people who are in apartments, although you can put one up in an apartment building, just like take, uh, you can take a, a pole and put, make a, uh, put it in a cement, uh, put some cement into a bucket and you have yourself a stand and put your antenna on there and you can, even an antenna or a satellite dish and you can, uh, you can have like at least KU band. But in North America, it tends to be uh, um, everything's on, on the big dish, on C-band. There is content on KU band, but it just seems to be a slimmer amount of variety where the bigger and juicier variety of the channels like the Me, uh, Me TV, um, well, Cozy's on KU band. Um, the, some of the network channels, uh, Decades, all the DigiNets that, all, all the DigiNets. So if you live in an area and you don't get all the DigiNets, uh, C, C band side like tends to have a lot of that and they have a ton of other content on there as well. News feeds, I'm, I, I think there's like every week it seems to be there's a new news channel popping up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so like there's lots of news uh, on satellite. Uh, there is lots of religious content and that's what the, I think that's the bad rep that uh, uh, Free to Air Satellite has is like it's all religious channels. Which is not true. There is a lot of religious channels, but it's not all religious channels. I think there's, um, if people say that might be looking at Galaxy 19 which is probably the, um, the easiest satellite to get because you can get it with a small, like a 96 centimeter dish. I pick it up with an old uh, Shaw Direct dish. Uh, and if you're in the States, you can, if you had an old Orbi dish, you can, you can aim at that satellite and get like maybe about a couple hundred channels. So some people are probably just, it's almost like antennas. When people say an antenna won't work in my area, they use the small little mud flap antennas. Yeah. It's like, no wonder it's not gonna work if you're in a week. Now those work okay in strong signal air. So I'm not, I'm not totally dissing the flat antennas. Some of them work pretty well, but um, it sounds to me like some people go to free to air satellite TV, get the small dish and only get like mostly religious channels when they actually need the bigger dish to get, what is that, C-band you said? Yeah, C-band, like a big, like basically the big black dishes that you used to see like in the 80s and 90s, which still work today. You might need to do a few upgrades to them. Uh, you might have to change the LMB for the newer receivers. Um, but the, all that, like even to upgrade a, a, a C-band system could be like two three hundred dollars I, I say two or three hundred dollars because uh with everything going up in price it's like mm -hmm. a, it's a little bit more expensive yeah now. i feel like i can't even say prices anymore in case you guys didn't notice i have to black out the pricing and all the antennas i review because i got people saying oh this antenna was only sixty dollars last year now it's 120 dollars i'm like yeah look at everything else everything's antennas changing are not so the recording of this video is in august yeah, 2022 august 2022 so we'll see how dated that the yeah. time goes people right. people will be watching this a thousand years from now and like <laughs> these yeah guys. who are these people <laughs> <laughs> look what were they wearing <laughs> But um, yeah, so that sounds, um, and just to be clear, some people may not know, you don't have to have free to air satellite dishes on the roof, correct? You can just put them in the yard as long as they have a clear line of sight of the yeah, sky, Yeah, as long right? as you got a clear line of sight. If you can see behind me here, I got them on the fence. Not the best place to put it on the fence, but it works. Uh, mm -hmm. You can put it on the fence, and uh, I've, I've put them on right here on this deck and just uh, in a bucket with a, or, or a short tripod and I didn't have to get the height. That's the nice thing is if you're in like a mountainous area and you're not getting anything, at least the satellite dish, you'll you'll be able to get line of sight to the satellite. Yeah, and if it doesn't have to go on the roof, those of you who have the wife that says, I don't want that satellite dish on my roof, well, you could put it behind the house and no one will see it. Yeah, you can, you can run a lot. You can have a pretty decent cable run with those things too and uh, run it into your house and still get signal and have it kind of hidden away. Um, except for me, I, I, like, I like to see them. I like looking at them. 
Mm -hmm. I do too, same with the antennas. But the irony is, um, in terms of my YouTube channel, because I'm so busy, a lot of people ask me, what antenna do I have? And the irony is, I don't have an antenna on my roof right now because I just don't put an effort to over-the-air TV because there's not much, I don't have much time to watch a lot of TV. So I've just been using like an indoor antenna. I've been using a clear stream we're, antenna. We're, we're, we're two guys. We love the technology of TV, but we probably don't watch hardly no, any of the content. No, we really don't. Because people think it's odd. They're like, you're the antenna, man. You don't have a giant, you know, television. There's a lot of master. good stuff on YouTube, though. <laughs> yeah, no, there actually is. And, and the other issue is that like this, the network affiliates I get are strong enough to be picked up with an indoor antenna. Mm. So I don't really gain much with an outdoor antenna. I basically gain like a duplicate like Fox and a CBS affiliate that like there's not, it's not what I'm looking for. Now for some people, if they're in smaller markets where there's no MeTV affiliate and the out of market station is not MeTV, they would probably benefit with a larger antenna, but not everyone needs an outdoor antenna. I, I, I try to put an effort in all my indoor antenna reviews to say that if you run a rabbit ears reception report and you get, you know, it says good signals and you don't have too many trees around, you probably get away with an indoor or attic antenna. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be outside. Of course you get the best reception with it outside, but most people can't necessarily go on the roof and shouldn't go on the roof. So yeah. I'm not opposed to people setting up indoor antennas. What I, what I just did, and I just did a review on an antenna and I really like this idea, I got poles. Like these- uh, You reviewed an antenna? Uh, yeah, I, re you I did. Re you, re you reviewed a YouTube <laughs> antenna? Yeah. Okay, this interview's over. <laughs> So anyway, I took some poles. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. I took some poles. They're about five-foot poles. So I, and I have a knee injury right now, so I didn't want to climb up on my uh, tower. So I just took some five foot poles and they extend into each other. It took, it was harder pushing the button for the pole to get it to connect. Um, but I was able to get an antenna. My, my main um, purpose for this is if I go camping and I bring an antenna for the trailer and I want to put it up, uh, I can um, uh, set up an aerial real easy. And I don't have the crank on the roof of my, uh, my tent trailer, but at least with a tent trailer, you can unzip it and just stick your hand out and adjust your antenna and uh, get better picture. So that, that's something else I want to make clear too, is I get a lot of people ask me, what's the best RV antenna? Tyler, you should review RV antennas. The fact is most RV antennas are very limited in performance. Most oh, yeah. of them are small omnidirectional antennas. And really those will work okay, they're convenient, but the way to get the best reception with an RV antenna is to set up a more directional antenna. It doesn't have to be large. It could be a small clear stream antenna. And then as you travel, point it towards the major broadcast towers yeah. because then you get the major, you get most the most gain that way. If you just have an omnidirectional antenna that's set up there, you know, at the top, it's gonna receive, you know, TV stations not well in all directions compared to well in one direction. So I always tell people that I know a lot of you have asked me about RV antennas, and I said no. Don't limit yourself to an RV antenna because yeah, you're going to limited results. But another thing I've also asked with satellites is I've had people like uh, ask me about RVs for their satellite, either for subscription satellite or even for uh, free, to, free to air satellite for, for a KU band system. And it's pretty easy to get like a, a tripod. I'm going to say they're used to, they're, they're $20, but they're probably more than that because everything's gone up. Um, but uh, I, I put my... Um, uh, my uh, satellite dish on a, on a tripod and it's not temporary it's it's, uh, it's kind of like a temporary place where you put it especially if you're on the go so you can do that but also yeah with the rv it's, t it's just nice to have a directional yagi because you mm -hmm. can be way out in the country somewhere and far from the city but if you get a yagi you can get that thing on a post like locked in uh, to where to where you want to get your to where the city is to get a much better signal yeah, and to be clear to most of you, just so I can explain further in case you're not aware, um, omnidirectional antennas, they're very low gain. They don't work the best. They're good in strong signal areas. They're good, they're convenient because you don't have to point them. But the problem is they don't have as much gain. So for example, let's say I'm in a fair or weak signal area and I have an RV. If I have an omnidirectional antenna, I might not get many channels, if anything, but a directional because it has more gain and can soak up more of the signal. Yes, I have to get out and point it, but the end result is more reliable reception. I'm not talking about a big, massive antenna. I'm just talking about a small, like maybe a Clearstream or a Telvis de Nova. Those are even a little, they're also kind of multi-directional, so they're not a true omni, but they'll still get, you don't necessarily have to point them all the time. Like you could just set it up and probably get a decent no, yeah, channel. Set it up, do a scan. But and it then... will work the best pointed towards a major broadcast oh, yeah, tower. Yeah. So thank you for that point yeah. about, you know, omnidirectional 
my antennas and RVs. That's yeah. something I've, I've been meaning to tell you guys. Yeah, uh, you should do a video on that one. That's, <laughs> that's uh, definitely a topic. Yeah, no, I will at Begin some point. Beginning of summer, beginning of summer. <laughs> so yeah, and for those of, those of you who have stayed tuned in this interview, here is kind of the answer to the question. The best RV antennas is, as I said, like a smaller directional antenna. That's not an RV antenna. That you put on the RV, maybe if you have a ladder on the RV, you, you hook it on there, you get like a flat roof mount, put it on when you travel, you know, when you're done. And then use the antenna point compass or, you know, um, rabbiteers.info, see where the major networks are. Point in that direction, use a small tuner because sometimes moving an antenna from here to here can be the difference between locking a signal yep. and not getting anything. And you might want to do that before you, you're at the campsite because I've went to a campsite before. I just went camping this summer and there was like no cell phone signal out mm -hmm. there. And then there was like people, there was like this uh, septic bed uh, on the top of the hill and everyone <laughs> was staying on top of the septic oh, bed desperately trying to get cell phone signal. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of cell phone signal, it's funny, as soon as I entered Canada, um, I was listening to Sirius XM on my phone oh, yeah. using the data, and as soon as I crossed the border, it, it cut out. And then I noticed I had service, but there was no data, and I was like, crap, I'm not going to have data. And I, was, I was coordinating with Robbie Strike through, um, through Wi-Fi, so I had to go downtown in Kingston and look, up, look for Wi-Fi spots like it was 2009. It was actually kind of cool to not have the ability to check everything. I do that all the time. I, I don't pay for data because that is too expensive in Canada. Uh -huh. So I just use ExpressVPN. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a link in my videos for, uh, for an affiliate link for that. Um, but ExpressVPN or whatever. Uh, but I use that when I use public Wi-Fi because it encrypts your data and uh -huh. keeps you protected. But I mean, I pay $6 a month for ExpressVPN and I use public Wi-Fi. So it keeps, uh, keeps me protected and I can you know, look at my Facebook. I don't know. Yeah, VPN is definitely must have used public Wi Fi because the thing is, public Wi Fi is open. If you type in a credit card info on there, you know, there could be someone spying on you, so VPN is important. One clarification I do want to make the irony of the no data thing in Canada was I wasn't getting data, but I saw its service, and I thought that was odd because I thought Cricket Wireless had international, which is AT&T, hmm. had international data roaming. It turns out it was just a setting on my phone that I had to enable international data roaming. Oh, yeah. So after about two hours of living in 2009, <laughs> almost like with an iPod Touch, I realized, okay, I do have data, and I was able to coordinate with Robbie, book my hotel, and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a, it's a good test in case we ever, uh, the internet, you know, something happens. We had this happen in Canada. Rogers, uh, which is the big cable company in Canada, their uh, network went down and people, there was like ATMs were not working. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was um, businesses were not able to pr uh, process the payment processors um, and just do their online booking or whatever. And uh, yeah, just because Rogers had an outage. How many, uh, so how many main providers are there in Canada? I'm not talking about the MV. P and O's, whatever yeah. they're called. I, I would say there's Rogers, there's Bell, and uh, there's some smaller companies, but the two lines like that are going out, uh, like we have power lines here, and there'll be a phone line and there'll be a, a cable line. Uh -huh. So pretty much the two main ones would be like Rogers and Bell. Um, those are the two main ones. There's some smaller ones. I use um, like a, a, a company that's a smaller one, but it's cheaper, mm -hmm. and it's start.ca, and I'm very happy with them, but they use cable. Like they actually use cable to the house mm -hmm. for internet. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, uh, so what was the question again? I was asking about cell phone companies. Oh, cell How phone? many of Not the internet. cell phone companies do you uh, have? Oh gosh, we have a lot, but the two, and that's the same two companies are the two main tower, like they're the, the owners of the towers is yeah. Bell and Rogers. Okay, because in, in the United States, and we have tell three. Us. Someone's we, gonna correct me in the comments and say, tell us. <laughs> that's all good. We have, we used to have four, we only have three. So any cell phone company have, whether it's Cricket or Metro PCS, they go off either AT&T, Verizon or T-Mobile. There used to be Sprint, but Sprint was so bad, I was actually glad that T-Mobile took them over because you don't live in the States, but Sprint was just this absolutely horrible cell phone company. Oh, they, really? yeah. they had, when I was at Penn State, there was one bar of service and I said, You're, you guys have one cell tower in one of the largest universities in the country. You guys are idiots, no wonder you're failing. And sure enough, they failed, so good riddance to them. Yeah, <laughs> but the company can't, yeah. It's customer support, big companies, you gotta do more customer support. Got that right, yeah. big time. All right, yeah, so anything else you want to talk about in the meantime? Um, I, th I, th I think we're good for now. I, 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 want, to, um, I want to see what you're going to do with that test there uh, for uh, the B uh, Channel 2, and, uh, Channel 2 uh, in, uh, which you came up here for. Yeah, so it was a very interesting experiment that I got. Um, so there was still a TV station on the air in Analog in Bancroft, is it? Yeah, I think it's C. C I, I, I. Yeah, CIII TV2. Which is a global affiliate, and I can hear the audio on my antenna here in Kingston. I can't see any pictures. Uh -huh. I don't have a big enough, uh, like, because it's low VHF. Most antennas don't really, 
bother putting like a big long elements on them because most that's only what channels to six so a two to six for vhf yeah low vhf which yeah. isn't there's pretty much no low vhf in canada so it's not necessary but yeah the signal is pretty weak I, I was able to get in my hotel actually playing around with the antenna and a bunch of spots i was able to get it very weak in black and white but the problem is it's really fascinating that i told you yesterday that it came in okay on the ground floor of this hotel but on the sixth floor of my room it would not come in like at all and that really shows that low vhf has such a problem going through building material that it can be oh, crystal yeah. clear outside on the ground but not come in you know six stories up yeah. because of the so building would, would that channel my question to you is you'd be able to answer this uh would that work well for tropospheric duct ducting yes in yeah. fact a I lot of dxers have caught it and one in my area caught it last year and it was picked up in portugal so the tv station that i showed oh, in yeah. the other video um it can be picked up in portugal like through eSkip. So eSkip is basically, for those of you that don't know, when there's certain atmospheric conditions, TV signals, instead of going to, into outer space and shooting out to outer space, because Earth is curved, some of you may not believe that. Earth no, is it's curved. flat. <laughs> Shut up. We're going to have some arguments now. Okay, no. All right, so let's just say atmospheric conditions allow TV stations to travel further than usual. And the low band is really good for that. So CIII TV2, especially analog, it's really hard for digital. Analog, it's a lot easier to catch it because it only lasts for a few seconds, while digital, it's almost impossible to get just because of how like tricky and, and, and temperamental it is. And as I said, like a dude in Portugal picked up this TV station. So if you go, well, want to look on a map, see from Canada to Portugal, it's a pretty far distance. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now, world's flat. There's a porthole at the at the South Pole uh, where the, where where the where the where the globalists and the New World Order is hiding and. Uh, and uh, when satellites are actually like balloons, really in high altitude, they're not actually in space. It's all conspiracy. <laughs> hey, make your channel on that. Maybe you'll get a lot of followers. Look at, um, I won't mention specific names. No, 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 no Plenty sorry. of people out there that have a lot Full of followers. Full disclosure, I, 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 I challenge any flat earther, just explain to me how satellites do work. I mean, I, I, I'd be interested in, 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 in hearing that argument. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to check the comments a little bit yep, later yep, to see some of the arguments. Yep. So I think most people agree with that. But uh, <laughs> not to get too, uh, so may call this almost a political like, statement. But uh, yeah, no, anyway, like, I was just going to say that um, low, low frequencies are a lot better at traveling through during tropo conditions. The certain yeah. times in the spring, summer, and fall when TV stations travel really far for a certain amount of minutes or hours. And I couldn't believe that a guy in Portugal was picking up the TV station. It's, yeah, it's it, absolutely it, it crazy. Be, although, it was, unfortunately, it was global. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they are. They're like NBC. They're like an, the Canadian NBC affiliate. Uh -huh. Or is it CBS? They have the Young and the Restless on. It shows like Yeah, that. they look like a CBS. But okay. in terms of like the quality, I, I wouldn't say exactly what company. But it's one of the big media companies when they take Cor over one Cor of the Yeah, uh, Global is owned by Chorus Media. Mm -hmm. and uh cw is what i'm thinking of the cw is kind of like a flop it's not much of anything anymore. oh really really yeah. yeah i used to get it and i don't really see well, i never watched it <laughs> it's still around but yeah. it's for sale oh, so yeah? it can next star is potentially going to buy Tyler, it out, we have so. we have money we, we can't we, 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 we can't put our funds together and buy it eh? no oh, no we can't buy it crap. i have my own youtube channel so i put out random content such as this i don't think the average american would like this kind of content but i appreciate you guys too no no, no I, I mean just it doesn't even have to be our channel it's just better content than what they have on <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's mainly, I think it's Garden, the issue was the CW targeted people who are too young that probably aren't watching live TV. Oh, okay. So that's probably why it flopped. And that's another video I plan on making is oh, just yeah. that, and I think we talked about this yesterday, was that local TV stations really have to start targeting millennials and Gen Z because people my age aren't really watching live TV. They're watching on demand. And yeah, sporting events, they'll watch it. But I tell people I, I talk about TV antennas. Everyone looks like I looks at me like I have a giant like crater on my head every time I tell them TV antennas. Like, uh, what? That those still exist? Like, the reason they're asking those questions is because these TV stations have done no marketing whatsoever towards them. And if they don't do anything in the next 20, 30 years, it's going to end up like AM radio, where no one's listening to it except you know people who are much older, who eventually, unfortunately, will be off the earth and there'll be no listeners. I'm, I must be like, old. I listen to AM. <laughs> there's not. Too I'm many. 44. So, but if you ask like anyone my age, <laughs> yeah. like. Do you listen to AM radio? They'll say no. If you do, if you say live TV, they may say I watch like NFL or you know uh, NHL on on this, on TV, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and AM's gone. Like even AM stations are starting to like have FM repeaters. We have one in this area where it's it's talk radio, but they have like an FM uh, because it's just clearer. Like in plus, you can't 
a.m. you lose signal at night. Yeah. Like it's clear during the daytime, but then what happens as soon as the sun goes down, you, you unless it's a clear channel station, there's only a few oh, okay, clear yeah, channel stations. Yeah. The stations that stay powered 50,000 watts throughout, oh, yeah, you know, day and night, there's yeah. only a few of them. But yeah, in the United States, they had what was called the AM revitalization plan, where they basically gave all AM stations an FM translator just so that they can maintain their audience because the issue is they're they're losing their audience. There's people my age are not tuning into AM radio. They're not getting like yeah. new people. But I um, what I wish would catch on uh, is the HD radio that you're talking about. Yeah, that could have caught on. I think the issue was the power limits were set way too low because oh. they're on the same frequency. Yeah. And they, if it was too much power, it'd interfere with the analog. Yeah. And um, but yeah, that could be a thing. Now an interesting thing in the future is ATSC 3.0 could have the ability in theory. There could oh, be an ATSC 3.0 signal to, and, and that cars. would be audio, yeah, in cars yeah. that would have potentially a hundred stations. So that's something. And, and you could have like TV audio with that too. Yeah, every car is like a smart car. Well, we're going to we're going to self driving cars now too. Mm -hmm. So we're, people are just going to sit and watch TV while they uh, yeah. While and the car I believe Sinclair. Uh, I may be wrong. So Marshall, I apologize, the guy with Sinclair, if I quote your company wrong. But I believe, take it with a grain of salt, that I'm pretty sure Sinclair is a is taking this approach to ATSC 3.0, the on the go mobile per, you know mobile aspect of it in connected cars and taxis, potentially the radio. I'm pretty sure I read something about their proposition for like ATSC 3.0 radio. So, you know, ATSC 3.0 is just so amazing because there's just so many possibilities and we're in such the early stages yeah. that it's basically the sky's the limit. Like it can potentially be, you know, a whole bunch of stations, a lot more stations, better picture quality, better reception. It could be, you know, radio station, it could be connected cars. It it's, could also it's gonna be forty channels on one channel that look like uh, <laughs> that look like uh, watching the internet video from like two thousand and six. <laughs> well to my surprise though, the with the advancements in the encoding, they actually don't have that issue. Yeah. I was um when oh, I yeah, looked, they're using Hevex, so it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. HEVC. So yeah, yeah, some of them will be like SD, but the thing is, instead of like all blocky, what you guys see on over-the-air TV now, it'll actually be pretty clear. In fact, I saw an SD broadcast that Sinclair was doing experimentally back in 2019. Yeah. And I thought it was high definition. That's how clear it was. Yeah, it looked that good. And you you recently, you recently did a video about um, MPEG uh, MPEG4 or a Hevex. Uh, um, ATSC broadcast. Yeah. So they're starting, that's like another alternative to ATSC is, but unfortunately, the unfortunate part about that is a lot of TVs are MP, only have MPEG 2 encoders and uh -huh. will not work with some of the sub channels that are in MPEG 4, right? Yeah, they're doing that very slowly. So most of you guys probably saw that video that I posted. And what's happening is there's only a few stations nationwide, maybe like 10 to 20, that they're changing the encoding from um, MPEG-2 to MPEG-4 because it's more efficient, they get a better picture quality and fit more sub-channels in. But the issue is, as you said, older TVs, most TVs are fine. But if there's, you know, households which are in most viewing areas that have, you know, a TV from like 2008 or 2009. My TV from 2009 died long ago. <laughs> well, some of them last. I had a yeah. TV oh, from yeah. 2009 until last year. Um, but the issue is, so I think what networks are doing is they're slowly, uh, not maybe the main networks, but the sub-channels in smaller areas, they're kind of experimenting. So okay. they're switching like one less watched sub-channel over to see if they get responses of people saying, hey, I can't get it anymore. And then over time, and maybe like five years, oh, even if ATSC3 nice. doesn't necessarily take off, because it's it's hard to explain. I may make a video in the future about why it may also flop, because it's, it's very hard to explain. It's a voluntary standard, not enough involvement from major networks and then just the fact that there's not much spectrum after the FCC keeps selling our TV spectrum to cell phone companies. Yeah. But, and, uh, and satellite spectrum too. Yeah, they're it's, selling satellite it, it, spectrum and, too. They need to stop selling things that don't belong to them. But uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so uh, MPEG-4 is a great alternative. ATSC-3 for some reason doesn't take off where it could be like the HD radio of today where it's around, but it's just not much. Um, MPEG-4 will allow a lot more TV stations, not like a lot more, but more TV stations, better picture quality. Yeah. Uh, not as good as ATSC-3, but better than what we have Yeah, mo and most channels are broadcasting still in that over 20 year old standard, which is MPEG-2. and even on satellite uh, like for example Galaxy 19 a lot of the channels are still MPEG 2 mm -hmm. and they're actually very low bit rate so they don't look the most nice uh, as nice as they could be they could mm -hmm. use the same so I think these channels are using paying about five thousand dollars a month to have um, uh, the, the channels up it all depends it could be depending on the bit rate it could be either five thousand or I think a, uh, an HD channel costs about twenty thousand dollars a mm. month to have Dang. it on satellite. But I mean, if your religious organizations pull this off, because like, yeah. they get the donations, right? And it's yeah. like maybe that's what I need to do. 
just become a TV preacher. Yeah, become a television. Save somebody, I love you. Yeah, the church of antennas. Yeah. <laughs> Worship the satellite, just bow down all those gods and behind us. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, and that's why there's a lot uh, there's a lot of religious channels on satellite is because they pay the money to be on satellite. They want to get that reach of people where, I, for whatever reason, a lot of the broadcast channels, all the networks don't necessarily have their channels on on free free air satellite anymore. They used to, and there's a few that actually still do have their channels um, on on satellite. Um, but but it's uh they don't really care or they don't tell people they're on satellite. It's like kind of one of those things is meant for just the back calls. Mm -hmm. And if anyone can get it, it's it's uh, good good for you. You get it, but they don't. It's, it's almost like over the air TV. It's like they fair game. Yeah, it's, it's almost like over the air TV. They don't really tell people that. No, they're they on don't. Over the air TV, they just say we're on cable. 20 you know or something yeah. like that you know yeah the only the only exception is a huge shout out to scripts the media company that owns some tv stations they are actually putting an effort to promote over the air tv right um, on, yeah. to get people back to antennas because what when was the last time any of you guys saw a local tv station say hey did you know you can get cbs3 with an antenna here's what you do they never say a word they'll, about they'll it. talk so about their streaming they go to their website yeah. stream, stream us through the through the whatever their but they don't is. want you to know that yeah. you can get them for free all their networks in free high definition with an antenna Other Otherwise, there's no reason why I wouldn't promote it. There's retransmission fees involved. Most of you know what that is. And, um, you know, I talked about it. And, and the thing is, though, at least they understand in the United States that it's a market in itself. So over the air TV, people aren't going to go pay for their signal. So they have to at least maintain the audience they have for over the air TV. They don't want to promote the people who have cable to get over the air TV, yeah. but people who have over the air TV. We, we had a keep. situation, I, I talked to you a bit, a bit about that last night, is. Uh, that um, we used to have a channel here in, in uh, Watertown uh, that used to go up all the way to Ottawa. So Ottawa used like their in, the early days of cable. They had their antennas uh, um, uh, basically pulled the channels off the antenna. That's how antenna, uh, cable first started. They just uh, had big master antenna systems that pulled channels from far away, and they would uh, rebroadcast it on cable. So we had a comp uh, company uh, out of Watertown, a channel out of Watertown. And they were going to Ottawa, and then all of a sudden they decided to change it to another channel. So it was another CBS affiliate, and they didn't even tell them. Really? And then they they found out that uh, they were no longer on cable. They were getting most most of their views and business was actually here in Ontario. But these northern New York stations, when they changed to another station, they were quite upset that they um, uh, that they weren't getting all the ad, ad revenue of basically owning like a good chunk of Ontario, mm -hmm. because that's like people in Canada would ha on, with cable would still have CBS, ABC, and uh, PBS and all, all the network t channels and uh, all of a sudden it just changed without them even knowing. Yeah, I find that interesting about Canada. So in Canada, um, a lot of people who live near the U.S. border, their main priority is to get U.S. channels because there's a lot more. The funny thing is Robbie sh showed me his antenna and what he got. He gets 40 channels. Out of the 40 channels, only one of them is from Canada. The rest are all from the United yeah. States. So it just goes to show yeah. you something. Even me, I set up an antenna. The antenna man could only get one Canada channel. So if I can only get one Canada channel, they're doing something there, wrong. There, there used to be, within, back when it was analog, they had uh, rebroadcasts. Yeah, CJOH was one yeah, of them. Yeah, CJOH was one of them. People used to get that from far away because I think it was on channel six. Yeah. And uh, people used to DX it and get it like, you know, it was like, wow, there's still an analog channel, like up to a few years ago. And um, yeah, because Canada was kind of slow to go digital, they still had their analog repeaters going up till at least 2015, 2016. Or yeah, I, I yeah. read that, and it's funny because I always thought that they were like the US where they had a hard deadline and it was just 2011, they're all shut off because I used to have relatives in Erie. And when I went there during the after the digital transition, I had a small analog TV and I thought, I'm not going to get anything but because the low powers were still on the air in the right. United States. And I was getting like dozens of channels from, from I think, uh, Toronto, perfectly crystal clear across the lake. And I was like, wow, they're still analog. And then I thought when they shut down, it's kind of like with the United States. A lot of you guys probably thought in 2009, it, would be, it was the end. But even like to last year, there was some still on the air. Yeah. In Canada, I guess the full power repeaters were still allowed to broadcast. Or yeah. smaller markets like in Kingston, I didn't realize that the Kingston channel was yeah, on until like they, 15. They still have like channels in, in big cities, but some of the rural areas, and Canada's a big country, and free satellite TV would be a great solution if they it put really their channels on be. KU Band. Because like it costs 20 thousand dollars a month and how much is a broadcast tower i don't know a lot more I than that no idea for like an hd channel uh -huh. so um yeah and then just to have like channels out there it'll be interesting to see uh if orby tv this this company that's relaunching orby tv because they're going to do a kind of a subscription uh base and also a free base uh, a free uh tier is what 
I gather. So I'm, it's very in the early stages, but that's what it looks like they might maybe do, or they're doing at this at this point. I don't know if they'll encrypt all the satellite channels because because they have channels that they definitely want eyeballs watching, uh -huh. religious channels, and maybe some news channels. You know, that would be so smart. They yeah. would get so much of the market if they did that. If that's true and that actually ends up happening, that Orbi TV has like a free tier with some of the basic free channels, maybe not the major networks, but you know, some channels, and then they have the tier where you could pay for get more more um, yeah. valuable channels. That would be great for people, even over the air viewers. They would get a lot of install people, you know, installation requests. Like, because the people with antennas that maybe don't get all their ma major networks reliably, they could at least have the Orbi satellite dish and get some extra channels, even if it may not be the best content. It's free content. Yeah. Um, but that's really in its infancy uh, uh, stage of them relaunching. So we'll see what yeah, happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. And we'll, we'll both be covering that as it uh, oh, yes, as, as, as it uh, as it uh, plays out. Um, but uh, it's also uh, you'd wonder if it's a little bit too late to the game, like for satellite, because like now we have we have like streaming, we have satellite internet now is getting a lot better. So, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, if if the price is right, as long as they don't go like with uh, some of the other satellite companies where they're charging over a hundred dollars a month for, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they, they they could make a go at it. I mean, I, I keep keep telling the cable company, I'll get cable, I'll, I'll pay you five bucks a month, five dollars a month for it's cable. Used to be that way. Yeah. Long time ago. I, I used to pay twenty dollars a month, like back in maybe two thousand and three. Is it was, it was a, they it was a, and that was a, a a promotional plan. But I was paying twenty dollars a month, and I think I they got me up to thirty because I wanted a, a wrestling channel. And mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's uh, and then once they said, hey, we're going to be like fifty, sixty dollars a month, I said, no, I'm just going to go back to an antenna. To be honest, what what what, what I think is happening is that the cable is becoming the antenna where people just didn't really use the antennas. Antennas are becoming cable where basically it's a bet it's superior and people are starting to go to it. Oh and yeah. Well, like in, back in the nineties, I, uh, I didn't even have a hundred channels on cable. And now with an antenna, you get over a hundred channels. You get more channels with an antenna in certain markets than you do with cable and you don't have to pay for it. Yeah. That's what's amazing. <laughs> now there are some exceptions, but there is a huge, in case you guys aren't aware, um, over the air usage, people who use antennas has significantly increased from about 10% in 2009, 2010 to it's up to almost 30 or 33% really? now. Yeah. So it's about double or triple the amount of people. And you can see with the success of my YouTube channel, yeah. Yeah. how many people are going to it. And it's, it's good to see like antennas in like a Walmart or a place like that or Canadian Tire or, <laughs> or a, uh, what do you got in the States? Uh, you got Target uh, and places like that where you go and you'll see an antenna on the floor, right? And people say, oh, an antenna, they still work. And they'll see like, they'll look, I, I think it's kind of helpful for over the air TV. Mm. They'll see like, oh, network TV with this thing. What companies should do like Walmart and Target is they should understand the market. So what I don't don't like is when companies like Wal you know, stores like Walmart or even Best Buy are in like a bad signal area and they all have itty bitty small antennas. And I'm like, you're not gonna get anything with that. Like they should staff the store relevant to the reception. Like if you're in like a weak signal area, they should have more Televis and Channel Master and Weingart antennas that they carry. And then in like the cities, the small ones, because the issue is a lot of people who try out antennas. They buy the one and you tell them not to buy. They buy a little piece of crap and they're like, oh, an antenna won't work in my area. I tried one. You don't know how much that grinds my gears, guys. When I have people that will say like, oh, an antenna won't work in my area, I try one, I'm like, hold my beer. For those of you who don't know, I grew up in the Poconos, which is one of the worst areas in the country for reception. I I still got stuff. So if I can get stuff, don't give me that. An antenna won't work in my area BS. Uh, <laughs> I actually, a funny thing about that to back it up with data is with my antenna recommendation service, I've run about 10,000 online reception reports and I found that about 99% of people get all their major networks. And even the 1% that get like very weak stations can barely get you know anything. They still get some channels, just maybe not all of the major networks. So definitely antenna is the way to go. The thing is it's so critical to get the right one. And you guys have heard me preach this on my YouTube channel, um, but you go to Walmart, you're destined for failure. Yeah. If you go to Amazon, you're destined for failure. It shouldn't be that way. It really shouldn't be that way. You should be able to go to Walmart and Amazon, see nice Televis, Channel Master, Weingart antennas at the top because they are the better performers. Yeah. But instead, you see these smaller ones. Not all of them are junk. I mean, like antennas direct make some. Yeah, it all depends on who you are. Like if you just want your local channels and you want something simple and low, uh, low impact, like the Televis antenna that you reviewed that uh, 
the, 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 the Nova one. The Nova one is probably like that's the intent I tell everyone to buy. That is a really good small <laughs> the, directional, yeah, but get, it also has to do with your your area. So yeah. if you're in a weak signal area, you don't want a small. Yeah, directional. you don't want a small one. Like for me, I like to DX. I like to see like you know, on a clear day that I'm not going to get all the channels. I want to get a directional antenna and aim it toward Toronto, aim it toward Montreal or someplace like that, and see just just to see what I can get because mm -hmm. I that, I'm a nerd. I like to play, I, I yeah, like doing that sort of thing with an antenna. <laughs> so um, for me. Probably the antenna I, I, I would need would be a, a, a very high gain directional uh, UHF antenna, especially UHF because I don't, VHF doesn't really matter for the far away stations because the UHF stuff in the summertime travels pretty far. You they have a some, lot more power. Yeah, now they may more. not travel like it's a little bit different in terms of tropo and stuff, but in terms of like more reliable, consistent, like DXing, I'd say UHF is a little bit better because VHF, they're just severely underpowered. The FCC is at the power limits way oh, too really? low. Yeah. yeah, what happened is, in case you guys aren't aware, during the digital transition of 2009 afterwards, because the FCC sold channels um, 52 to 69 to cell phone companies, and when they did that, TV stations were, cl were spaced closer together on the same frequency, so they had to limit the power, so they didn't interfere with each other. And then when they sold more spectrum about two uh, years yeah. ago, they had to further reduce, maybe not necessarily reduce it, but keep the power limits low because the issue is if they have if they actually have decent powered output and and cover their whole market as they should mm -hmm. they could interfere with stations in the other markets like all right a lot all of right. The same scientists and engineers we need to expand the li-fi and laser technology so I'll use uh, radio spectrum for cell phones with that spectrum mm -hmm. and leave the radio spectrum alone yeah for stop, a stop messing with it. there's gonna be nothing left <laughs> in like 10 years if they keep messing with it but uh no so that's something i always thought was interesting was just i noticed the vh so so uhf can go up to a uh, thousand kilowatts to so one megawatt um vhf it's like very low it's like 50,000 watts usually 30,000 watts some areas it's like 10,000 watts and I understand yes lower frequencies don't require as much power so you can have a, a VHF that's 80 kilowatts do better than a UHF that's 500 kilowatts mm -hmm. the issue I feel is that UA VHF at like 50 kilowatts is just too low because the way it doesn't go through building material well it's just they're underpowered in my opinion i think the fcc is aware of it but they can't really do much because if they increase the power they're going to interfere yeah. with each other maybe they're looking at like they have the alternative in urban areas too they have that alternative to stream locally yeah and so maybe that's and, and in a more uh, ur, um, urban area you're going to have more uh, access to internet and I, uh, it's kind of a sad thing because i like broadcast yeah I like so it, do yeah. i and so do 20 200 000 of my viewers yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes. it, it's true so anyway i figure we'll go wrap this up now because yeah. we went talking a little bit for a while i appreciate all of you who stayed tuned for the whole discussion everything robbie i thank you so much thank for you for having coming me. over i'm and, glad to see you i come up in canada and uh, for the first time out of the u.s mm -hmm. that's true <laughs> and it was a great experience and you guys will probably see robbie more on my youtube channel you may see me on his youtube channel so make sure you subscribe to his youtube YouTube channel what's your youtube channel name again it's robbie strike and you can find me at robbiestrike.com and i also have for the satellite stuff i have a site called uh, free satellite tv.net uh you can uh, find me there and uh and uh, follow some of my videos um so if you want to learn more about that uh, check out some of my videos that i made i made a lo lot of videos on this topic uh, for satellite TV and antenna stuff, and I kind of I'm a kind of a tech guy. I talk about all sorts of tech, anything basically radio and tech, right? Mm -hmm. AV media, radio tech. So I, I, I kind of cover all of it, but I, I do talk about a lot about satellite as well and over the air stuff. Cool, and I'll link everything in the description so you guys definitely follow his channel. He has some really good videos. So again, I appreciate you guys checking out this video, and stay tuned to my YouTube channel for more awesome videos.